So we're going to learn how to use the T table. But to do that, I'm going to have to take a step back and teach you something called degrees of freedom. And actually, um, Gossett didn't invent or come up with the idea of degrees of freedom. R.A. Fisher did. And actually, Fisher's the one who sold everybody on the brilliance of Gossett's work. Before Fisher came along, people read Gossett's stuff and didn't really apply it. And then Fisher came along and said, hey, you guys, actually, this is it's pretty good stuff. We need to be using it. And so what he did is he came up with a clever way of making Gossett's table um, much more user friendly. And so I'll, I have to kind of break it down into pieces to explain it. But one of the pieces he needed to explore was degrees of freedom. So I have a, a picture here of a robot. Um, and this might be something you'd see along um, like a car assembly line. Maybe you see it kind of drilling a hole or picking up a thing and moving it over there. And, um, and so if you've ever seen those videos, you'll notice that sometimes this part will turn and then this part will turn. Well, degrees of freedom for robotics means how much that robot can move. So if this part turns, that's one degree of freedom because it can move in that way. This part turns or goes up and down, that's a second degrees of freedom. Here might be a third degrees of freedom because that part moves. This part would be a fourth degree of freedom. Maybe it swivels, so that's a fifth degree of freedom. And so in robotics, we'll talk about how many ways in which the robot can move. And your arms have degrees of freedom, right? You can move at your elbow and your wrist, and then your hand has multiple ways it can move. And so it's a kind of a nice analogy to bring back mathematically, because we're gonna talk about how the numbers are free to vary, how many numbers can move. So Fisher came up with this idea. And it, the bottom line of what he's saying is that if we already know the mean of our sample, then we have our sample size minus one numbers that are free to vary. And this is a hard concept to get, so I'm gonna show it to you in a different kind of way. This isn't really how statistics is normally done, but it can help highlight what we're doing here. So let's just say that I have a sample and I know the mean is 20, and that I sampled five people. So we wanna think about how you calculate the mean. So if you can say in your head or out loud, how do we calculate a mean? So hopefully you said we sum up all our scores and divide by the number of scores there are. So if 20 is equal to the sum up of all the scores divided by the number of scores that there are, we then can backwards solve and know that the sum of all of our scores is 100, right? So 100 divided by five is 20. So if we backwards solve, we now know since I have established these two first two numbers to begin with, that we had a mean of 20 and a sample size of five, I now backwards solve to realize, well, my scores are going to have to sum up to be 100. So in my face-to-face -face classes, I have a lot of fun and I let students pick any number they want. I go, hey, everybody, let's have a fun game. Any number you want, pick a number. It can be anything, just nothing in the millions because I have trouble writing all those zeros. So let's pretend we're doing that and a student shouts out 400. I say, okay, great, you get to pick 400. Somebody else, and I'll pick on somebody else, and that person says 35. Okay, now somebody else pick a number, and they say 68. Well, that's great. Now somebody else pick a number, and this person says two. All right, so before I let the last person, because remember, we have five people in our study. Before I let the last person pick whatever number they want, let's take stock of where we're at. So remember, these had to sum up to be 100. That was the rule we set out to, to begin with. Already I'm over 100 because I have 400 plus 35 plus 68 plus 2. So let's kind of see where we're at. If I add all those scores together and I still don't have my fifth score, I now know I'm currently at 505. So if I'm at 505 and they have to sum up to be 100, what am I left with? And I'm left with negative 405, right? So I am 405 over where I should be. So I'm gonna let this last person, and it's usually some poor sucker in the first row who doesn't realize what I'm gonna do. And I say, okay, you get to pick the very last number. You get to pick freely, just like everybody else did. But by the way, it has to sum up to 100. What number do you pick? And hopefully you'll realize they don't get to pick because everybody else picked such random numbers and we set the rule that it has to sum up to be 100. They lost their freedom and they now have to say it's negative 405. That's the only way we're gonna come up with a sum of 100. And so what happened was, once we established what the mean is, we lost one degree of freedom 
because that person has to make up the gap that these people uh, were freely allowed to induce. Now again, statistics doesn't normally work where you calculate the mean to begin with and then fill in the numbers later, but it helps to show you a little bit of what um, Dr. Fisher's goals were, which was that once we know this, we lose a bit of freedom in allowing the other numbers to move. Now, why do we need to talk about this? Because Gossett's table has a different shape for every different sample size. And he printed the pages based on sample size. But I remember I told you there are three different kinds of t-tests. There's one sample t, independent sample t, and a dependent sample t. Independent sample t is where you have two groups looking at each other. So if you have two groups, how many means are you going to calculate for your statistic? Two. If we have two groups, we're going to have two means. If we have two means, how many degrees of freedom are we going to lose? Two, because we lose one degree of freedom for every mean that we calculate. And so now we would have to have a table for the one sample means, and then we'd have to have a separate table for the two sample means. And rather than making a new table for each uh, example of a t-test, Fisher realized if we use degrees of freedom, we can use the same table for all three tests because at the end of the day, it comes down to degrees of freedom. And so I'm going to walk through the table with you now. And what's important to recognize is that the degrees of freedom is defined as n minus 1, your sample size minus 1, your sample size minus the um, number of means you've calculated. Now, we're first going to learn how to do a one sample t. Since it's a one sample t, we're going to lose one degree of freedom. Uh, when we start learning about an independent sample t, we'll revisit the table and see how we read it a little differently. The same table will work, we just have to read it a little differently because we'll have two means and therefore we will lose two degrees of freedom. So let's go ahead and look at Gossett's table. You'll notice that it's different than the z-table. It's somewhat similar, but it's different enough to warrant um, a, new, a fresh look. First thing you'll notice is this one's separated from two tail and one tail, which is very nice because now you're not having to um, read all the different parts of the distribution and looking for the area 2.5% or the area of 5%. This is the 2.5% on either side area. This is the 5% on one side area. So that once we know whether we're doing a two tail test or a one tail test, that'll define whether we're on the left side or the right side. Now you see this blue line here. Sometimes that confuses students, so I'm just going to tell you ignore that blue font. And then let's learn how to read the rest of the table. So it should have been every sample size listed here and then um, the critical t value here. And remember, we set our uh, rejection region to be an overall 5% rejection region. So that's what this um, number here is saying is 5% rejection region. We'll talk about the other columns in a minute. And so this table already split 2.5% on this side and 2.5% on that side. So let's just say that it had, um, we were looking at this particular row, that would mean you'd have to have a 2.120 or higher or a negative 2.10 and lower to be in the rejection region. So that score 2.120 is defining where this line is on the T distribution. Now, rather than having a line for each possible sample size, they did a line of degrees of freedom. So that means if I had 16 people in my study and I did a one sample T, I'm going to lose one degree of freedom from that study and I'm going to actually end up with 15 degrees of freedom. So even though I had 16 people in my study, my degrees of freedom are 15 and then I can find that this is going to be the number that defines my rejection region. Since we're really going to have a new rejection region for every possible sample size, we want to make sure we're clear which one is our calculated t value that we did the math for and what is the number that defines the rejection region. So the numbers that define the rejection region, we call them critical t values. So these are the numbers that define your rejection region and then we will differentiate that from the actual math that we do where we calculate a t. So let's kind of explore this a bit. Let's say I had um, 30 people in my study. My degrees of freedom should be what? Let's say 29 because I lose one degree of freedom. So if my degrees of freedom are 29, 
my rejection region is defined as 2.045 or negative 2.045 and lower. Notice the table doesn't specify the positive and negative because they figured you know how to do that by now. Let's say it was a one-tailed test and I had 30 people in my study. If I have 30 people in my study and I lose one degree of freedom, I'm gonna have a degrees of freedom of 29. And so if it's one-tailed, you'll see it's gonna be a 1.699 or higher. If it had been a lower tailed, it'd be a negative 1.699 and lower. You with me so far? Okay, let's talk about these other rows. So let's say that you wanted to be a more rigorous researcher and you didn't wanna just settle for a 0.05 rejection region. Um, let's say you wanted to make it harder on yourself as a researcher and you wanted to have the rejection region be only 1%, which means a half a percent on either side. Let's go back down to that 29 degrees of freedom. You see how we've made it harder on ourselves? We now have to get a 2.756 or higher or a negative 2.756 and lower to reject the null. We made it much harder on ourselves as researchers to be able to reject the null. But maybe that mattered to you. Maybe you're doing something that's really important and you didn't want to have a high error rate. Let's say you lowered your uh, rejection region to 0.1%. So, wow, you've made it really, really hard on yourself. Oops, ignore that. Um, <laughs> If you wanted to do that, we would come down. Now you need to have a 3.659 or higher to reject the null. So what these columns are, are what you would do if you were making it harder on yourself as a researcher because you really wanted to have stringent science and, and you weren't satisfied with that 5% error rate, but you wanted a 1% error rate or a 0.1% error rate. And imagine, let's say that I had done the math and I did some calculations and I found that my T-score was 2.9. If I had a T-score of 2.9 and I had a 29 degrees of freedom, if I used a 5% error rate, remember we set alpha to be 5%, if I had a 2.9 in my math, would it be in the rejection region if I had a 2.045? Yes, it would. Let's say I went over here and I said, oh, I'm gonna use a 0.01. If I had, a, my math came out to be a 2.9 and my critical, or sorry, my rejection region was defined as 2.756 and negative 2.756. Would I be in the rejection region if my math came out to be 2.9? Yes, it would. Let's say I had this as my rejection region. If my math had come out as 2.9 and I needed a 3.659 and higher or a negative 3.659 and lower, would it be in the rejection region? No, I'd fail to reject the null. So if I'm a researcher, I might not go as far as, you know, I might backtrack one and go, okay, well, let's just go with this one because this one's far more impressive. I made it really hard on myself. Um, and I still rejected the null. So maybe I'll just pretend like I was going to do this one to begin with. And that's what so many people were doing in the old days. I say old days, but I was actually alive at those times. But early on, people were kind of just looking at what degrees of freedom um, and what alpha rate you could go to before you would stop rejecting the null and then they would kind of stop there. And so while we in this class are going to use a 5% rejection region, I want you to recognize that people will tend to lower this number because it's far more impressive to have lower numbers here and they'll go as low as the, the T calculation will allow them to go. And the same thing would be for the one-tailed test. So reading this T table really um, comes together when we start doing the six steps to inferential statistics and you can see how we would use this table for step three when we're defining our rejection region. So check out the next video where we're going to go through an example.